Okay, good evening everybody. Um, good evening that is in local time in, in Cork, Ireland, which is where I'm based. Keen O'Neill is my name. Um, and we're broadcasting out of Cork Institute of Technology in the southwest of Ireland. Um, good morning to uh, all our listeners and colleagues over in the, the United States. And I guess good night to many of our uh, many of our friends who often listen to these webinars in Australia, New Zealand and, uh, and that beautiful part of the world. I'm delighted to uh, introduce you all to uh, our colleague, Sean Maycheck. Um, Sean is based in uh, Seattle University, where he is the laboratory supervisor for the University Sport and Exercise Science undergraduate program. Sean, you're very welcome. I'm delighted to have some time to spend with you this evening. Thank you so much, Keen. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, as I said to you earlier when we talked uh, off air, Sean, it's uh, it's great to speak to someone with your background and your expertise, uh, which is quite broad and diverse. In, in recent webinars, we talked specifically to coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, etc. So I'm looking forward just to you know to delve a little bit deeper into um, how you actually use um, athlete monitoring in general and specifically, obviously, with the, the MetriFit athlete monitoring. Um, platform. But just before we get to that, Sean, you might just give us a brief introduction to yourself and tell us how it is that you've uh, you've arrived at this stage of your career working with athletes and working on a sport and exercise science program at Seattle University. Right. Um, well, it began 10 years ago. I uh, was hired at Seattle University when the sport and exercise program was launching here. And um, as you can imagine, it was small at that time, and uh, a lot of the focus was based around service, wellness. We were actually embedded in a hospital at that time where I would work kind of in partnership with the cardiac rehab center there, where we were doing work with, you know, cardiac patients and pulmonary uh, patients. Sure. Um, at, we developed a partnership, and then we, we actually started a... Uh, a kind of a startup company um, called Potentrix that we would um, work in a lifestyle wellness setting, um, lifestyle medicine, treating exercise um, or treating conditions with exercise using, um, you know, exercise science practices as well as the, the medical uh, side of things uh, with the owner being a cardiologist herself. So, but within that company, I mean, we were always kind of maintaining our academic um, effort in uh, with Seattle University. And as the program grew, um, uh, there it came a point where the entities had to separate. So um, essentially, I mean, and, and through Potentrix, I got a lot of work. You know, we, we sponsored a lot of athletes. I, um, and I worked a lot with, uh, you know, all number of different types of people and corporate research and these sorts of things. And uh, but it ended up that the uh, we had to split. Seattle, Seattle University moved the lab back onto campus. That was three years ago. Okay. And at that time, I met with the, the soccer team, and we uh, we kind of uh, launched this collaboration in the uh, hope to basically develop our own uh, sports science model that we leveraged a lot uh, of what we've read um, that's going on internationally. So that's basically how I've gotten to where I'm at now. <laughs> Okay, excellent. And I mean, I see from just looking at your profile there, and you even mentioned it there yourself that um, you know that you've actually worked in applied corporate research as well, and not just with an athletic uh, population, where people often think of, of health and um, monitoring. You know, um, from an athletic perspective, it's quite obvious. But um, I'm even working with uh, with Peter and Anne from MetriFit in terms of looking at applying a monitoring uh, program for large corporate entities, as well as third level students, university students like the, the guys you would work with, uh, as well as the obvious um, cohort, which would be the athletic population. So it's great to see you have that broad and diverse background um, to inform us with this conversation tonight. So just in terms of where we are this evening, um, Sean, we're going to look at some key areas here as as we always do and you know just to seek your thoughts your inputs on, on some of the key topics that we like to look at which uh, of course is first and foremost the uh, the purpose and indeed the value um of using um you know subjective monitoring subjective questionnaires we we'll talk a little bit about athletic uh, training load session rpe because you work very closely obviously with seattle university's um uh, soccer team um, and then we can talk about data. I know, I know you're a bit of a data geek like myself from talking to you. 
So I'm really interested to hear how you use that data and indeed how you communicate it back to um, to your players and your athletes. Um, and then obviously the, the the big question, as always, when you're working with platforms like this, is is how to engage and how to ensure adherence. So you really get the you know you get the value you know from the whole process. So um, right. so yeah, with that, how, how strongly do you value the whole process of um, of subjective questionnaires and athlete monitoring from that perspective, Sean? Uh, well, you know, the subjective side of things, in my opinion, is extremely important, especially when we start to consider some of the issues that we're encountering with more um, external measurements or like the objective quantification of movement. And uh, in, in my opinion, um, as long as you can educate your athletes and have somebody, you know, act and rate with honest integrity, um, which can be an issue at some points, but as long as you can get um, that buy-in from the athletes and the coaches, it's 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 that kind of internally valid measurement, if you will, of how they're doing. You know, it's like uh, you, you can try and take all these measurements. We were trying to do stuff with heart rate variability. We were trying to do stuff with, um, you know, some interesting uh, bioimpedance values to assess fatigue and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, if that measurement isn't lining up with what the athlete's telling you, um, you, you might want to reevaluate kind of the tools that you're using. So in my opinion, having those subjective questionnaires where you're just simply asking them to rate how they're feeling, that gives you um, a level of, of, of value that uh, I don't personally think we've achieved on the uh, measurement side of things. Sure, sure. And I guess working with a, a soccer squad, which is relatively small, similar to a basketball squad in comparison to something like, uh, you know, like an NFL or an American football squad, even at collegiate level, you know, relationships tend to be a lot closer with your players, right? I mean, it's similar to, to any soccer teams back over here. So I guess when you have that closeness with your players because of a small group, and then you have these subjective questionnaires. Do you, do you find that that almost enhances the relationship between a coach or a sports scientist and players? You know, that's a that's a great point, Keen. I really actually, just by interacting with them and giving them the chance to communicate how, how they're doing and feeling, I do think it allows them to feel more comfortable and you do get that greater sense of intimacy because they are um, investing their own energy and time in, in, in creating this system that everybody can have the confidence that um, we're at least, uh, you know, communicating with a, a shared understanding of a platform and, uh, and that we're concerned about every athlete um, being ready and at their, their top level of competing um, when, it's, when it's the most important. You know, when, when game time comes, we want to make sure that um, – We've done what we could to to prepare them and take care of them, and um, especially with the the tool a tool like Metrofit, there's no real there's no re reason why you shouldn't be um, looking at all these different angles in terms of performance and health. So I I agree it does increase the intimacy and in communication. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, as, as a coach and practitioner myself, uh, as well as an academic, one thing I love about the platform is that it's it's so easy for you know a non-sports scientist and, and in many cases a non-elite or professional athlete in, in some cases to understand the terminology i mean mood state sleep sleep quality energy levels you know diet all of these things are easy to comprehend and very often what i find you know and, and even my own coaching career over the years what i've been able to do with more experience as i get older and, and have more hours on the clock is to simplify things to enhance players and athletes understanding sometimes when i was younger i probably you know almost tried too hard almost trying to be too complex too clever at times and what i like about the platform here is that the terminology is so simple to use or to understand and therefore you know by deducing that it's easier for them to engage with it would you agree yeah no i mean i i i have the same problem you know like we do a lot of testing on, I mean, outside of Metrofit, we do a lot of testing in the lab and there's no way I would, I would spend, you know, the energy to try and explain to them everything that's being measured and everything that we're looking at. It, it, you have to, you have to, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to decide what's going to make them a better soccer player. Right. You know, <laughs> so I think um, um, that simple simplification is uh, a, a very uh, important step that, 
Um, and then also, I mean, not just simplifying it, but making sure that they understand that, you know, this has nothing to do, I mean, maybe it has a small portion of, of, of what might make you a better soccer player, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it's just helping you understand and us understand how we can keep things moving forward in a, in a positive direction. So yeah, the simplification is great. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And in terms of the data itself then, um, obviously your own background is, uh, is in sport and exercise science as well. So you would have had your numerous years of, years of training, you know, as an undergraduate student preparing yourself for this career. Um, in terms of the actionable data or the data that, that you actually use or you find greatest value from the system, you know, what particularly are you focusing on there, uh, Sean? So what we're doing with, um, well, one, I, I, I love to, look, to log in just to get a quick snapshot of any red flags that I might need to communicate or emphasize to the coaches. Uh -huh. That's really a nice, easy thing for me to do, and I can do that within a few minutes when sure. I when I log in. But the, 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 your overview, right. taking in everything quite briefly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that initially is, is fantastic. But um, one of the things that we're doing with this data is I'm ex uh, the export feature for me is fantastic. And the database that it exports in is compatible with a lot of the business intelligence platforms that I use to tie in all of our various data sources. Um, so, so we're not just using uh, Metrofit. Like I, I mentioned, we're also monitoring their movement with GPS accelerometers and their heart rate during trainings. Um, we're, we're, we're tracking how much weight they're lifting. We're tracking their game performance. We're, track, we're tracking coach evaluations. There's a, a number of things that we're um, kind of trying to integrate. And so the ability to export for me is huge. And one of the main things I'm using with the export feature, I'm actually recreating some of the measurements that you're showing here. Um, okay. So the acute to chronic workload ratio, I'm tracking over time. And um, so, I, you know, with the Metrofit, um, that's where I uh, derive the, the internal loads. And then with the GPS and the accelerometers, I, uh, I'm, I'm using that to track the external loads. And so by tracking both of those, I'm attempting to uh, get the full picture on, like for instance, if their internal internal load's really high on one day, but their external load's below average, then I would be thinking, oh wow, this is a little odd. Maybe there's something going on here with fatigue. Maybe it's a, there's an environmental issue. Maybe it's the training that style that day. I mean, there's a number of questions that um, I would probably try and answer, but having both sets of information allows me to try and figure out really what's going on and to kind of uh, dilute all that into some message that I can give to the coaches and athletes that makes sense sure. and is of value for them. And that's why I, I particularly love the, the platform um, for collegiate athletes, because just going back to the example you just gave there, for example, at exam time, you know, it's it's quite uh, normal to see, obviously, internal load spiking uh, in a negative sense because stress levels are high. Right. Mood right. is low. And even though their training might be progressing, you know, as part of the program, their internal training load may be telling you something different. And, and that automatically leads to a conversation with, with a player or with a group of players, depending on, uh, on what their individual and respective training loads internally um, are presenting as. Exactly, and that, and, and you know, it's funny you mentioned that because we're that's a, that's something we're uh, pursuing on the side. We're looking at the relationship between exercise and cortisol, and if there's any protection of of having regular exercise. So, totally agree specifically with that example too, and I'm excited to see what we learn there. So, all right, that's obviously a lab-based experiment you're doing with your colleagues in the sport and exercise science program, is it, Sean? Yes, that's correct. Yep. Well, wow, fascinating. And any anything that you know you can share with us from your recent findings, just on that for people you know who have an interest in physiology and applied physiology out there. Well, um, at this time we're we're collecting samples, so there's not much to say uh, at all, actually. <laughs> Right. So uh, yeah. I, my my colleague Dr. Molly Welsh um, and uh, Dr. Stephen Lucky, they'll be, I think, publishing this uh, whenever we get enough data to to have something worth talking about. But the question, I mean, the question is um, substantiated, and I think there are some pretty clear um, indications that exercise obviously is is a is a 
a level of protection, but we want to know for certain. So we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Excellent. Let us know. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah. We will. But just one, yeah. one thing on that slide we're, we're seeing in front of us there is, um, and it's something I'd like to unpack a little bit with, uh, with you, just because of the nature of your background and your expertise. Um, like myself, you love data, um, and some people wouldn't have that same level of affection, or perhaps even understanding might be a, a better term, of too much data. So I, I guess when you have things like heart rate variability, you have your accelerometry, your GPS data in there, you mentioned respiratory rate, and then you also have your internal measures. I mean, how do you distill all of that down into you know, meaningful inferences or, you know, meaningful information that's right. relevant to the coaches and more importantly or equally important, I guess, relevant to the players themselves, Sean. Right. Um, that is the huge question that we are uh, trying to uh, accomplish. And I think we're not alone. I think internationally, even a lot of the articles you read, that's the big question. What are we yeah. What are we doing here? Um, uh, and so for me, I'm, I'm collecting a database um, that's as uh, ex, you know as vast as I can get it, so mm -hmm. that in the event a research question does rise, I can go back and you know maybe look at uh, certain relationships. But from a communication uh, standpoint, when, when you're talking to coaches and athletes, um, I always try and emphasize you know how how can I make you a better team or player you know for soccer, and so for them. Um, it, it ends up being quite simple. Um, we want to know, uh, you know, for instance, some of the things that we've uh, learned in the last couple of years is that there's a big difference between starters and non-starters in soccer. Uh, yeah. So when, when you talk about soccer, uh, a lot of the training load that they're getting is actually in competition. That is in, well, one of the things that we've found is that their competitions are almost double the workloads that they're getting in a, in a practice setting. And whether or not that's a, a a good or a bad thing from a, a you know a training programming perspective, you know if you talk about an endurance athlete, that would n probably not be okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you're talking about a sport that's a lot more dynamic, a lot more explosive, a lot more, um, you know, it's it wears on the body. And so, can you can you train at that level, and in, in a uh, repeatedly, um, and expect your athletes to perform? At their at their top levels when it when it matters in competition, and that's one of the things that we're trying to toy around with. We're trying to figure out um, the biggest thing that we've found is that when they have two games or three games in a week period, we start to see um, spikes in the AC ratio. Okay. That um, especially for the non-starters or if they're a substitute, let's or let's say a starter gets uh, gets injured and uh, a non-starter has to come in and fill that gap. That's when we're starting to see those, at least from the published studies in, in Australia with the, the Australian Football Leaguers and... Um, Tim Gavitt's work. Exactly. Um, uh, that's when we're starting to see those uh, um, AC ratios get into the potential danger zone. And so we're, we're, we're actually now this year, we're, we're actually proactively looking at... Um, um, projecting forward, um, we're saying, hey, here's our two game weeks, here's our three game weeks, and we're projecting forward, and we're saying, what can we do in the in the in the month leading up to those those uh, those periods in time to make sure that the AC ratio is staying within that healthy band? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you're developing your chronic training load in the periods preceding where you're going to have high spikes due to a, an acute workload due to matches, for example, two in seven days or two in eight days, right? Exactly. Or, and, and there's another thing that I'm about to do is um, giving the non-starters or substitutes um, workouts that mimic game workload uh, because it is such a big part of the, I mean, when you, when you remove the com competition side and you just say, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a load, that's a training load, right? And, and they're missing that. So how can I replace that when they're not playing? Well, we're going to start looking at, you know, giving them uh, replacement workouts and these sorts of things. So when you talk about all the various data, I am distilling it down to the very, very, very simple, how does it help you become a healthier and more prepared soccer player? And usually that's just around loading patterns, to be honest. Yeah, very good. And I, I like what you're saying there, particularly with regard to the, to the substitutes, the guys that aren't getting as much game time. 
um, yeah. as a, because a lot of the work we're doing now with uh, my colleague Dr. Con Burns and PhD candidate Jason McGahan, we're actually looking at mimicking, you know, game day training loads within uh, game based training so that it's actually more game specific, skill specific, technique specific, so that they're not just uh, eliciting the same physiological gains, but also the game specific or the technical aspects as well. So um, we'll be publishing some work in that domain in, in the near future. So it's great we're doing something in a Gaelic games context here in Ireland, and you're doing something similar in a, in a soccer context over in Seattle. It's, uh, it's great to see that, you know, it's sports science is alive and well. Yes, it is. That's true. Yeah, it's a very exciting time. I, I think it's 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 kind of since the ten years I started down this down this road, it's it's really it's really developed in a way that I I find very exciting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I mean, I, I guess what you're saying there, particularly with the acute chronic workload, I mean, it just proves how invaluable um, a platform like Metrifit is in terms of monitoring all of these different things that are going on. Because without that you're almost shooting in the dark in terms of what you should be doing in terms of athlete monitoring. But when you have a platform like this and you have that data regularly, consistently, and at your fingertips, it really is invaluable, isn't it, for player welfare and athlete monitoring? Yeah, and I, and I can't stress the, I mean, there, and like, I, like I said before, if, if, if you have access to this data, um, not using it or i mean even the, the the barrier to entry to get in into even just a basic internal load tracking you know i'm i'm I, I admit i'm spoiled i've got a whole lab i'm doing all this testing i can look at all these different relationships but if you if you don't have the ability to do, to do all these measurements and you have you know a strap for time and you just you need something to give you a, a picture um i mean like i said the internal internal metrics they're they're going to give you just a holistic view of what's going on there and so if there's nothing else that you can do, I would say Metrofit would be the type of thing that um, I would be encouraging people to at least do something along the, the subjective ratings. Sure, sure. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I really couldn't. And, you know, back in the day, a lot of this was pen and paper. Right. You know, right. We have a platform like this, of course. It's highly usable and it's very easy to use and it gives you great feedback. But... I mean, you don't need to be a sports scientist is the key message we're trying to get out here as well. You just need to know what the questions are, how to attain the answers from your athletes. And, and that kind of brings me on to the next thematic area, which is coaching and feedback uh, in terms of your role with the soccer team in Seattle University. Uh, you know, how do you feel best practice is going there for you in this area? Yeah, well, you know, um, I'm, I, you know, as a, as a, professional I'm actually employed in the kinesiology department and so um, my tie with the athletic department is one of collaboration so um, that's the understanding of our relationship I mean they they do consider me uh, a coach you know they they told me that this year um, and but you know to be honest I am more communicating with the coaches especially when you talk about the monitoring stuff the testing side of things that's, you know, I'm dealing with the athletes on an independent level and I'm presenting the results in that sense. Um, but uh, in terms of the monitoring stuff, I'm really trying to guide the coaches and, and you know, they're the ones that ultimately are going to make the decision. You know, I might say, I might tell them, that, for example, like um, we do some monitoring during competitions, let's say. And I'll be like, hey, so-and-so is, uh, you know, you know, significantly above his standard work rate um and then i just leave it at that you know and, and i and, and i i they know their athletes you know they're they're with them a lot more they're they understand which athletes have maybe the mental toughness to push through a barrier like a higher workload um sure. and they'll make the decision on well i think he can push through it or maybe we should sub him out um and so i mean for me that was a big uh I, I stress the importance of okay, how do you want to communicate this, and and also what language are we going to be using when we're talking to these 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 athletes? Like, how much do we want them to know? Like, how much do the, like we don't want to create this culture where everybody is trying to be a lab champion or everybody is trying to run the most miles in 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 a game, sure. um, because maybe those miles are chasing the ball. Maybe that's not the right kind of miles. In fact, one of our best athletes. Um, he's not the highest, he, he doesn't put, put out the highest workload, right? He's really selective about when and where he, he you know, sprints or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
uh, I always try and emphasize to them, you know, this is just information. It doesn't mean you played well or bad. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'm just telling you uh, this this information to give you the i you know the inf the basically the answer on how much workload should you be getting. That's basically what I'm trying to emphasize with them. That if you want to be a better soccer player, practice shooting, practice passing, practice the technical tactical side. Listen to your coaches. Um, um, and ultimately, I give the coaches uh, the the final say in, in what they're they're going to do with this data. Um, and like I said, the athletes don't see all of it, so <laughs> it's kind of um, it's kind of a it's it's definitely a, a balancing act when you talk about um, what you communicate, how you communicate, and even who you communicate with. Um, certain athletes are, take the the numbers very very seriously, and so. <laughs> uh, it's it's a uh, probably a psychological question there. <laughs> sure, and I, I've got a couple of those athletes as well who they just want more and more information, more and more data, and very often they actually might be missing the wood from the trees because yeah. they're losing sight of what is important. Of course, information, of course, data is important, but ultimately, as you said, it comes back to the core tenets of the game, and that information is just there to to help them to be a better soccer player, you know, and not to be a you know a better sports scientist. That's your job. For example, right. exactly. And, yes. You know, one thing that I really liked about what you were saying there as well, and you know, someone with a sports science background, but also someone who's a coach, um, was that you talked about the importance of communication, not just between yourself and the players, but also with yourself and the rest of the coaching team. They're getting obviously the prize information that they need and and you know obviously they're they're using that to help them make informed decisions do you find sometimes that there is um would you call it tension or maybe almost a, a struggle for time or for information between the sports science and the coaching uh, network within your setup yeah there um i mean so it, it's a difficult it's a, it really is a difficult um that's a difficult question because I mean I think everybody has their own philosophy on what makes you a talented or a, a quality athlete, and every coach has their own little take on what that might be, and so you can you can get into um, situ. I mean, basically what we've done is uh made the communication of the sports science data i basically do that almost exclusively with with one of the head coaches okay and so um and and then he takes that and he packages it and or, or you know transmits it to the other coaches in a way that um you know he finds to be appropriate um uh, we are talking about potentially setting up um, like quarter quarterly presentations just for uh, you know keeping everybody on the same page mm -hmm. but um, I think it's important to make sure you're defining roles up front because uh, there are some coaches that honestly they've straight up told tell me I know there's value in this um, I, I want to be a part of this leading edge, this push for becoming a, a, a better uh, athlete, better coach, better team. Um, but to be like, they just straight up tell me, to be honest with you, I'm not going to learn all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, I'm not going to look at it. I want you to tell me what you think is important. Um, and so I think um, as a coach, um, it's important to understand what, what level of investment you want to be involved with this sort of thing. And then, um, but having the, the dialogue and, and the understanding, I think uh, up front for us really helped uh, draw clear boundaries so that the amount of tension that might come up in maybe when we have conflicting opinions, it, it doesn't really um, stop us from doing a good job of um, looking at the data and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but sure. that, that that's upfront a, understanding, I think, is was huge for us. Sure. And I think that's a great point because not only do you need role clarity amongst your players and your playing squad in terms of what their role is on the pitch, but of course you also need that clarity within the management and the coaching team as well. And yeah. I mean, that just takes me on to to our last point, our last key theme of uh, of today's chat, and you know, it's quite an important one. And very often it comes back to the relationship between you know, between management, coaching teams and players, but also, you know, a mutual respect and trust in the processes that are used, be they coaching on the pitch 
or using, you know, things like player and athlete monitoring platforms like Metrofit Altovich. So, I mean, how do you engage your athletes, you know, with this um, subjective and qualitative, uh, you know, analysis of their lifestyle and their, their wellness? I mean, how do you ensure that adherence is at its maximum level to, to really elicit the best possible outcome from using um, the Metrofit platform? Yeah, and you know that this was a development um, over the, the the two or three years that we've been doing this. Um, I will definitely say initially, I think there was a lot of pushback, and or maybe maybe it's just maybe it's just developing the right habits. I think that might be a little bit more. And in, in fact, I think the coaches almost. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I remember it. I, I remember early on when when we were having uh, issues with you know getting people to to report. Um, regularly, um, you know, I told the coach, I just straight up told him, I said, you know, if I, if I don't get them to report regularly, I can't really give you anything valuable. Like a lot of the literature and a lot of the evidence-based, you know, science that we're basing a lot of these things off of require you to have regular reporting. Um, and it's skewing my values of these ratios if, if we're not getting that. And so he actually told me, he's like, okay, I want you to give me a report that tells me how many, how many athletes are reporting and how much, how often, and and kind of give them a ranking, if you will. And he used that as a uh, as a leveraging tool, and I think in a way as a disciplining tool to keep to keep his t team um, kind of uh, organized around the thought that you know this is a job, you know, you know, it's part of how we do things. If you're not committed to that, um, then you're you're not committed to us. And so it was in a way he was creating a, 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 a way for him to, I guess, make them appreciate and be more regular and have that work ethic to, to do the small details that, you know, a lot of people say that's what wins championships. It's, the, it's that last couple percent, you know? And so I think he's using it as a way to keep that discipline uh, a big forefront of the team. Sure. And I mean, something I also use, you know, with my own athletes and um, with regard to this in terms of adherence is, is effectively trying to get them to buy into the process whereby they understand the value of it themselves and how it can improve their performance as opposed to them being told how important it is and what they right. can benefit from it. And I, I just feel that whole process of education, it does take time and it takes some vetting in and it takes obviously them establishing a routine. But I, I certainly feel for long-term sustainability, and I'm sure you have this to a really high level with uh, with your soccer team, that once they really do buy into that, and you know they, you know they trust. It comes back to that term, trust, and uh, you know trust between each other and trust with their management team and their coaching team that this is going to make me and this is going to make us a better athlete and a better team. Um, and it simply is 45 to 60 seconds every day. Leave the rest to us in terms of how we use that data to help you to be a better athlete. And um, that's something that, that I've found works very much and uh, very well with my athletes. And, you know, the, the GAA in Ireland, the Gaelic football is an, an amateur game, but it resides in a professional ethos, if that makes sense. You know, they still train yeah. five days a week. You know, they still play big matches, big days. Um, and, yeah, our adherence will be up at 95 plus percent, you know, with that group of players. So um, I think once they buy into it themselves, it makes all our jobs easier, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, and you know, and once you get over that initial, um, you know, habit forming period, they start to see like, wow, he's actually asking me about, you know, my stress level. Like, what, what's going on here? <laughs> it's like, you know, so I think, um, as you say, once you once you get that buy in, the value becomes clear, and I think that definitely, um, can, uh, in terms of long term sustainability, it really really helps. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's a nice place to wrap it up, whereby that that old saying. You know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there when, it you is. Have, when you have an opportunity, as you said, to ask those questions, they, they really feel like you care and that they're being listened to, you know. That's um, it. Sean, that's absolutely fantastic. I'd just like to, to thank you for taking the time uh, with us um, today to, to share your story, um, your background, um, as I said, which is very, very interesting. And I noticed you have a huge interest in, in music as well. It's great to have different interests outside of your professional life. So I hope that is all going well as well. And um, and it's just great to hear from another practitioner, a sports scientist, as to 
to how to use the Dimetrifit platform. I learn something every time I speak to to an expert in the field like yourself. So um, so thanks for that, uh, Sean Maycheck from Seattle University. And just before we uh, we wrap up to all our listeners, as always, I'd just like to thank Fives, who are our sponsor for this uh, Metrofit seminar series. They've been very supportive of this initiative, and and I hope everybody out there is is enjoying what we're trying to do here in terms of sharing the word and encouraging best practice by listening to others who uh, who actually use it. So, Sean, thanks once again, and take care, everybody out there. Thank you, Keen. Yep. Have a great day.